I'm going to turn the microphone over to, uh, to Dr. Joseph Gerson now. So Martha wanted me to do a whole lot tonight. Um, uh, to begin with something I said in Sarajevo and talk about Peace and Planet, I'm going to talk about the dangers of nuclear weapons. I'm going to talk about the history of, of U.S. empire. Uh, I'm going to talk about diplomacy, and I'm going to talk about organizing in 20 minutes. So, so yeah. So, so let's begin. You remember the Lincoln movie, our Secretary of State, Seward? In 1850, Seward was saying that if the United States wanted to become the world's dominant power, we had first to control Asia. Next. Uh, we have a bit of a plutocracy, a bit of an oligarchy here. Uh, our Secretary of State is a Forbes. Uh, back at the time of the opium trade with, um, uh, with China, the opium war, uh, his family was involved in bringing opium from Turkey. Um, you know, it's a long, long, difficult history we have. Next. Next. Yeah. So, so uh, I have a I've had, my life has had a peculiar path. Um, yeah, I ended up the middle class Jew at Georgetown University back when, Catholic school. One of my classmates was a guy named Bill Clinton. Uh, we had a great course on U.S. diplomatic history uh, taught by Jules Davids, who was the principal, we didn't know at the time, the principal ghostwriter of Kennedy's uh, Profiles in Courage. And we had this great lecture, I always remember this lecture, uh, in terms of the 1890s. Uh, and he described how uh, in, in the early part of the 1890s, Roosevelt, uh, Cabot Lodge, and Admiral Mahan uh, really moved to build the fleet that we needed to uh, challenge the British uh, control of, of the seas. Uh, you know, with, when Seward was, was, uh, was around, uh, we couldn't get the path to Asia because the uh, Brits and the French and the Germans and the Spanish all had the the um, stepping stones, the islands that we needed for coaling stations. Uh, but with the, uh, with the sinking of the um, main in, in Havana Harbor, we then had the excuse. I remember David's talking about Subic Bay, which I have since seen, as a beautiful, deep, perfect bay just jumping off a point to, uh, to, to get to the Chinese coast. Uh, so with that, we, we begin our global, global empire. Um, a book that's really worth reading uh, very important, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, you'll remember Jimmy Carter's uh, National Security Advisor, the founder of the Trilateral Commission. For his students, he wrote this book, uh, the, the Grand Chessboard, which is essentially a primer on how to maintain uh, the U.S. empire. Next. And what he, what he says there is that you know, kind of old geostrategy. Uh, it's to, if you control your Asia, uh, then you are the world's dominant power. And like Britain before us, the United States is within this frame of reference an island power. So we have to have, uh, our, as, he, as he writes there, we have to have our footholds on the, uh, on the western, the eastern, and the southern flanks of Eurasia to project our power. Of course, they have more than 1,000 foreign military bases around the world which help us. So if you look to Europe, for example, uh, we've had since 1945 NATO, which is the foundation of, of our power in, in, in Western Europe. Uh, for years, it's now under some challenge, uh, our control of, of the Middle East, the southern flank, and now we're into Afghanistan, right? Um, and this is our, this is our southern, southern flank there. Now India is our new major tacit uh, ally. And to the um, east, we have Japan, the Philippines, and of course, further south, we have uh, Australia. Uh, and this is the foundation of, of the empire. Next. Yeah, so, uh, you know, lots of details here. Uh, but, you know, just to appreciate how different our country is from other nations. To understand we have been at war almost continually since 1945. Uh, you know, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's, it's uh, Granada, whether it's Iran, whether it's Afghanistan. Uh, we've been at war, basically, since 1945 to maintain this empire. Next. And the reality, the very unhappy reality, is that our nuclear weapons have been, uh, you know, the ultimate enforcer of, of, of this empire. Uh, you know, think back to Teddy Roosevelt, uh, speak quietly, carry a big stick. Uh, most of us tend to think that the last time U.S. nuclear weapons were used was Nagasaki, uh, which I'll explain was not true at all. But even if you go back and do, do the history, you know, read, read the history, the principal reasons for dropping those A-bombs, the, the, the determinative reasons, uh, were that uh, Truman wanted to bring the war to an immediate end before the Russians came in. 
so I wouldn't have to share influence with them uh, in uh, northern China, in Manchuria, and in Korea. And by and large, that worked at least for a time. Next. Uh, then we come to, to NATO and, and the current moment, right? You'll remember that uh, there was an agreement between Bush and Gorbachev. Uh, Bush said that we would not move uh, NATO uh, one centimeter closer to Moscow uh, uh, in exchange for the Russians accepting the unification of Germany essentially on uh, West German terms. And now, of course, we have moved uh, NATO to the, um, uh, to the borders of Russia. Um, you know, if, I, I have no love for Putin. I mean, believe me, I have no love for Putin. But if you look from a Russian perspective and think about their history, invaded by Napoleon, catastrophe, invaded by, by the Kaiser, catastrophe, invaded by Hitler, catastrophe, all from the West. So when the United States moves to their borders with NATO, uh, we, you know, we should expect that there's going to be a bit of a response. Next. So then moving to, to current nuclear threats. Um, you know, the degree to which we live in Disneyland is, 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 is just stunning. Uh, so if we look at our, just the really current history, uh, we know that the United States conducted simulated nuclear attacks against North Korea within the last two years. Uh, we know that in the earlier stages of the uh, crisis, the war in Ukraine, uh, both the United States and Russia exercised their nuclear weapons, which of course provides a, an opportunity also for miscalculations and accidents. And most recently, as you know, uh, Putin has said that if you try to touch Crimea, uh, we have our nuclear weapons, don't, don't you dare. Next. So then, then we look to, to, to the Cold War history. And see, I, I woke up in, um, in, in Copenhagen in 1973 at a time when we thought the, the um, Middle East war was already over, you know, there was supposed to be a ceasefire. Uh, and people I was staying with were listening to Armed Forces Radio, uh, and it was explained on Armed Forces Radio uh, that the United States nuclear arsenal was on DEFCOM alert. Uh, I thought maybe it was a coup d'etat with Nixon in the last days of Watergate. And in fact, if you again do your studies, what you find out is that Secretary of Defense Schlesinger had said no major movement of U.S. troops in the United States without his explicit order because he had doubts about what Nixon might actually do. Uh, in fact, and with, I can't go into detail about it now, in fact, it was Kissinger who ordered that uh, nuclear alert in order to ensure that the Russians did not intervene to break an Israeli siege of, a, of an Egyptian army that was being denied both water and, and food. But that then led into, into other work and some close associations with Dan Ellsberg, who was an important teacher for me. What you see here is the number of times the United States has prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war in the Middle East during the Cold War. 1946 over Iran before Russia had the nuclear weapons, 56 in the Suez Crisis, 58 uh, Lebanon Civil War and the Iraqi Revolution, 67 uh, the Six-Day War, 1970 Black September, uh, 73, the one I just mentioned, 1980 and 81, the Carter Doctrine uh, to control the Middle East and the oil. Of course, you know, the, the oil of the Middle East you know, was the great prize of the Cold War era. Next. And then we have the same in Asia. I mean, we always thought, you know, it was this kind of overlay. People thought, you know, the nuclear weapons and, uh, and, the, and, and the building of the weapons was all about the U.S. and Russia. But to appreciate that that was in many ways an overlay, you know, at that point of about 100 years of, of, of U.S. Um, imperial history. Uh, which is what Brzezinski calls it, uh, in order to uh, maintain our, our, our dominance. So, you know, without going into details here, we prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war against Vietnam four times, uh, Korea at least nine, China at least four. Next. And then we come to the post-Cold War era. Again, we, we kind of live in this illusion. Uh, but beginning with the uh, Gulf War in 1991, uh, you had nuclear threats made by uh, Bush by um, uh, Bush, Quayle, Cheney, and uh, British Foreign Minister uh, Major. Other threats have included against uh, uh, Libya, um, uh, over uh, against China, over Taiwan, uh, Korea. Several times came very close to a, 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 Clinton. Almost wandered into a, a nuclear war, as did uh, uh, Bush in, in, uh, in the post Cold War era. Uh, we've had all options on the table against Iran. Uh, we had the simulated nuclear attacks against. Um, uh, North Korea. Uh, on September 11, 2001, uh, they put U.S. forces on a DEFCOM uh, alert. Uh, threats were made uh, uh, in 2002 
uh, both in relationship to the um, uh, 2001 Afghanistan and 2002 in relationship to Iraq. Next. Of course, other nations have made nuclear threats, but this is the sum total of them. So you get a sense of, 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 of the proportion here. Um, next. Uh, then I was in, I, I've participated in a thing called the Human Consequences of Nuclear Weapons uh, Meetings, been held in Mexico and in, uh, in, in Austria. Oh, no. The one in Austria in December, there were 158 governments there. A lot of experts came and, and testified. Uh, you know, you sit in there and you, you come out of it and, you know, you understand just, just how precarious uh, our situation is. Without going into detail, Eric Schlosser has written this book, Command and Control. You may have read some of his articles in the New York Times, um, and in which he basically runs through the history of U.S. nuclear weapons accidents. I mean, a lot of them. Uh, dropping uh, atom bombs over North Carolina, um, the weapons uh, falling in, in Spain, we lost one nuclear weapon off of an aircraft carrier of Okinawa. So long, long his Minuteman missiles blowing up, um, launching the bomb into, into Arkansas. I mean, it's a long history. Uh, on top of that, you've got miscalculations. Uh, now we have increased danger of cyber hacking. Uh, you've got the danger of, of terrorism and possibilities of failures of, of deterrence. Uh, which Schlosser concludes, and he was here talking to, to um, heads of state and uh, foreign ministers of, as I say, say uh, and, and ambassadors of 158 countries, his conclusion is that we are alive today more as a function of accident and luck uh, than a function of policy. Now, I'll just say here, you know, it's, it's not only on the United States, right? There's a recent study by Physicians for Social Responsibility uh, that says the exchange of 50 to 100 uh, strategic weapons uh, targeted on cities, say between India and Pakistan, and they had nuclear threats, exchanged nuclear threats in 1999. The use of 50 to 100 would lead to fires that would create smoke uh, that would lead to global cooling, that would lead to a collapse of agriculture in the northern hemisphere, which would lead to the starvation uh, and death of up to 2 billion people. So, you know, the dangers are, are, are very real. Next. Uh, so, uh, again, among my privileges, uh, I've, I've been able to observe just how isolated uh, the United States and the other nuclear powers are within the international diplomatic world uh, over nuclear, nuclear weapons. I mean, we can't really get this from reading the New York Times. Uh, but in, in what, a year and a half ago, there was the high-level meeting on, uh, on disarmament at the United Nations. Uh, just about every government in the world was there. Uh, after Ban Ki-moon spoke, uh, you had the, the speech by um, uh, President uh, Rouhani uh, of, of Iran, uh, speaking both for Iran and for the non-aligned movement. And he made essentially three points. Uh, one, Iran is not seeking a nuclear weapon. Uh, secondly, the world is outraged that the United States and the other nuclear powers have yet to fulfill their commitments under Article 6 of the NPT, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, in which they commit to good faith negotiations for the complete elimination of their nuclear arsenals. The rest of the world is really angry over that. Uh, and third, that the uh, United States had failed to co-convene the sacred promise in 2010 at the MPT review. The United States had failed to co-convene a conference in Helsinki in 2012 designed to begin moving the process toward the creation of a Middle East nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction free zone. Now, it was interesting that he spoke, but what was really remarkable was that one head of state, one foreign minister, and one ambassador after another got up and associated themselves with the speech given by President Rouhani of Iran on behalf of the non-aligned movement. And you can see how isolated it was. What was the United States response? We are fulfilling our obligations under the 2010 NPT review. Under China's leadership, we have almost completed the terms of reference of a glossary. Stunning. But this is how it's working. Next. Uh, and also, there have been others at the Human Consequences Conferences and others. I mean, you see time after time the, the isolation of, of the United States and the anger. And actually, uh, I think the, the Obama administration is hoping as it comes into the MPT review now uh, that it will be able to coast on the deal with, with Iran and the fact that we have gotten rid of 150 out of 7,000 of our nuclear weapons uh, on Obama's watch. Of course, there are alternatives. There's diplomacy. There's the idea of common security, which was basically the foundation and the framework 
uh, by which the Cold War uh, was ended. Next. So a little bit about the NPT, uh, watching time here. The NPT was negotiated in the late 1960s. It went into effect in uh, 1970. It rests on three pillars. Uh, the vast majority of the world's nations resolved that they will for, they forswear legally uh, never to obtain nuclear weapons, never become nuclear powers. In exchange, they get two things. Article 6 from the uh, nuclear, first five nuclear powers, uh, that they will engage in good faith negotiations to completely eliminate their nuclear arsenals. The need to do this was reinforced by the International uh, uh, Court of Justice in 1999. And then third, the major flaw in the, in the treaty is that uh, the non-nuclear nations have the right to generate nuclear power under the, for, for, for peaceful purposes under the, the, the rules and the guidelines of the International Atomic Energy Commission. You've just heard why that's a disastrous uh, approach. Next. Uh, so simply to say, uh, this is in, in Hiroshima. Uh, the man in the middle is Ambassador Kemet from, from Austria. He's the man who took the lead in organizing the um, uh, Human Consequences Conference in, um, uh, in Austria. Uh, his purpose there was to try to build some momentum uh, toward a successful MPT uh, review. Uh, you know, the fear of if, if the MPT review fails, if, if they don't come up with agreements, if they don't make serious progress, uh, given some past history I'll go into in a minute, um, uh, we're in danger of seeing that treaty collapse. Uh, and, and you can imagine where that would lead. Uh, yeah, so just, just to say, at the, at the conference in, in, um, in Vienna, uh, among the speakers was a woman from St. George, Utah. I and mean, we need to appreciate that we've got about a million downwinders in this country. Um, uh, you know, you've seen, the, you've seen the film of the soldiers in the trenches, and there's a tactical nuclear weapon, and a little mushroom cloud, and then they go running, running into it with all their gear, right? They were testing to see uh, how soldiers could operate in a nuclear environment. They're all dead. I mean, they all died of cancer, right? Um, uh, both with the atmospheric testing and even with the underground testing when there was venting, uh, the, the, the fallout would move uh, east. You know, they always did the test when the wind was blowing away from Las Vegas. Move across, no, serious, uh, move across Nevada up into Utah, up into, um, up, up into Idaho, and then it would move west, or rather east, and you know, they always Kodak would be told, shut down your plant because we've just done a test and we don't want you to expose all the film that's there at your plant. Uh, this woman, uh, yeah, one woman I know, her, her, her father, father-in-law died of cancer from uranium mining, her sister died from the fallout, her daughter died from the fallout, and she takes a line of pills every day this, this long. Anyhow, Michelle Thomas gets up there, wheeled on, and she says, my government has killed me. And she goes on to describe the horrors of living in St. George. She goes on to describe what her life and suffering are about and that she's about to die. And she knows who's responsible. She basically ran away with the conference. Next. Uh, Colonel Petrov is the man who saved humanity. Um, in terms of miscalculations here, he, he, he joined us by, by videotape. Uh, basically, we talked about miscalculations. Uh, the Soviet Union had been warned or advised that uh, the Norwegians would be testing a weather satellite the word didn't get through. Uh, he's looking on his um, uh, screens. It looks like a, a incoming you know, United States nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. He's supposed to push the button, and then they have eight minutes in Moscow to, to retaliate. And he looked at it, and I don't, somehow he just didn't think it was right. And so he didn't push the button. And we're all alive. And he was demoted. Next. So. In 2010, and Jonathan and Jim, a few other people here will remember, we, on, on the eve, and just to say, the, the Nuclear Armed Proliferation Treaty has a review conference every five years. And this is a time when the nations of the world can try to hold one another accountable to, to their commitments. Uh, we're in some danger at the moment, uh, as I said before, especially because the rest of the world doesn't, can you trust the United States at this point? I hate to say it, but uh, you look at the Middle East nuclear weapons, WMDZ, uh, free zone conference didn't take place, can they really trust the United States? In any event, we were amazed uh, in 2010 uh, that Ban Ki-moon accepted our invitation to address our conference at, uh, at the Riverside Church. And uh, more remarkable still, I mean, was, was his speech, which really expressed real compassion and understanding for the sacrifices that we all make uh, to try to get rid of nuclear weapons, to bring peace, to create justice. And then he went on to say, Governments can't do it alone. 
We need you to push from below. And that's why we're organizing Peace and Planet this time around. That's why I want you to be at the conference, why I want you to be at the, the march, at the rally, uh, and at our festival. Uh, our activity, just to say, our analysis is that our single issue campaigns aren't working, right? Uh, my, 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 my issue is nuclear power. No, my issue is um, uh, fracking. My issue is Walmart. My issue is uh, uh, police militarization, uh, racism, right? Uh, my, my issue is Venezuela. My issue is, you know, on, on, on. we have single issues. We don't, we don't make it. And we don't look at the connections between them and understand we've got to, we have to understand the connections between them and we have to build a more unified movement. So as we're building our mobilization, uh, this, is, this is what we're doing, working to integrate the analysis, bringing together movements as best that we can, recognizing that we're still early on, but we're committed to this also for the long term. Our two basic goals with the mobilization are one, that the review conference should end with a mandate to begin those negotiations that are required by law and which by U.S. law uh, are, are requirements, the highest law of our land, and secondly, to contribute to this integrated movement building for the longer term. Next. Uh, kind of a list of our actions. I think I, I've kind of gone through this. And then just to say who's, who's coming, who'll be there next. Uh, we've got more than 1,000 people from Japan coming. Um, uh, they're bringing uh, about 7 million petition signatures, um, uh, about 50 uh, A-bomb survivors. They're not young, they're not kids anymore. I mean, the most iconic uh, of the, um, of the uh, well, you'll see this picture, I'll, 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 next, we'll, we'll, we'll go there in a minute. We've got people coming from Korea, including Korean A-bomb survivors. I mean, there were Korean slave laborers in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, one, one of the uh, uh, A-bomb survivors from Korea will be with us next. Um, yeah, from, from Europe. Uh, actually, we have a member of the European Parliament coming from uh, England. Uh, we've got like 70 French, mostly from, from unions, uh, coming next. At our conference, uh, we'll be beginning by, actually, we just learned today that Angela Kane, the UN High Representative for Disarmament, will be with us to open the beginning of the conference. Uh, and then we're going to honor two of the most courageous uh, A-bomb survivors ever. Um, uh, Setsuko Thoreau lives in Canada. Uh, she does not have the kind of uh, self-diminishing Japanese way that sometimes is there. She is right out there, you know, just absolutely condemning the madness of what the governments are doing. What you see in the lower right-hand corner is a picture of, uh, of Mr. Taniguchi uh, from, from Nagasaki. You can't, this picture was taken by the U.S. Army. Uh, you can't believe that this man lived. Uh, he still has open wounds. He doesn't sweat. Um, uh, the photograph that you see there uh, was one of the photographs that was supposed to be at the Smithsonian uh, Institution uh, when they were to have the exhibit for the 50th anniversary of the Hiroshima Nagasaki A bombing. That exhibit was canceled by the Air Force, under pressure from the Air Force Association uh, and conservative members of Congress. Um, so he will be with us next. Um, Deep political analysis, Zia Mian from Princeton, Rainer Braun uh, from Germany, next. We are working to bring in young people. Look around this room. You know, we've, we're not going to succeed if we don't have young people really at the core of the movement. And so these are some of the young people that we're working with. Uh, the two on, on, on the right are actually our staff. The woman on the left is the young uh, Assistant Secretary General of the New Japan Women's Association. She'll be speaking next. Uh, Weldon Bellow, uh, some of you may remember from years back, I mean, incredibly courageous man coming from the Philippines. Uh, and in the, I saw in the, in the earlier slideshow about uranium mining and the, and the Navajos. Uh, well, uh, this is a, a man who uh, uh, Manny Pino uh, is, is, is working primarily around uranium mining uh, in the Southwest. Next, move the money, right? I mean, the United States is about to spend a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars. Uh, on, you know, for develop new nuclear weapons and the delivery systems over the next 30 years. I mean, think about your schools, think about the noise of the subway here, think about what we need to do to, 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 to work against climate change, education, I mean, you name it, a trillion dollars uh, for preparations to end the human species. Uh, Thomas de Toledo is coming from Brazil, uh, from the largest peace and environmental organization in, um, in Brazil, almost on here, next. Uh, a member of the German Parliament coming with us, and some of you will have followed Reverend Sekou, uh, one of the leading figures from the struggle in, in Ferguson. 
uh, actually originally from, oh, originally, but he, lived in, he was in Boston for, for quite some time. So he'll be with us both at the conference and, and the rally. Almost done. Next. Actually, we're done. We call it, actually, one more, one more. Yeah, uh, just, to, just two more. Uh, so on the left, <laughs> there we go. Uh, on the left, you, 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 you have um, Tony De Bruyne, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands. I mean, incredibly courageous. I mean, we can talk about the Marshall Islands, 64 nuclear weapons tests, right? The, the purposeful irradiation of the people of Rongelap. Uh, he negotiated the Marshall Islands independence, and he launched the uh, International Court of Justice cases against the nine nuclear powers. I mean, incredible courage to appreciate just how incredibly dependent these people are on the U.S. government and still saying what you're doing. That is only immoral. It's a crime, friends. It's a crime. We're talking about nuclear power. It's a crime. Uh, and then a, 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 a member of the Japanese parliament will be this. The last slide. This was actually from this summer in, in Hiroshima uh, when the Japanese were showing uh, how many petition signatures that they had at that time. Uh, you know, there is this a movement in which everybody does what they need to do. So in closing, what I'm going to say um, is, what I'm going to say is, look, I'm, I'm Jewish. I was born in 1946. Uh, when I grew up around the dinner table, uh, the question was, what, what should the German people have really done? How did they turn their, how did they turn their heads away? How did they participate in the crimes of silence, right? I think probably everybody in this room, um, it was most important to you is not only your own life, uh, but of your loved ones, your children, your grandchildren, right? Uh, the dangers of nuclear catastrophe are huge. They're huge, and we're accelerating it. So what I come down to is the question, not only nuclear weapons, but you know, it's also the you know, our drone wars, you know, the secret wars in, in the Philippines, uh, what the NSA is doing to all of us. You know, the question is, if, if, if we think that, 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 that we need to act for human survival, then we need to take some risk. Uh, we need to put our life energies into it. I mean, what is more important, going to the movies or serving human life? Uh, and um, uh, you can learn a whole lot more at our website, which you see here on the screen, peaceandplanet.org.